Because I don't have pet peeves. I have major psychotic fucking hatreds, okay? This is Guns and Butter. There's something happening, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there. This is what we need to worry about most in the world is the um the loss of offsite electrical power. So we've got a nuclear power plant here in Vermont, Vermont Yankee. And uh, off-site electrical power is the problem. What we're talking about in, in New England or in California or in Pennsylvania or in Wisconsin with any one of these nuclear plants sitting next to some body of water is not a tsunami coming in on the Connecticut River at Vermont Yankee, but it's loss of off-site power. It's a blackout, a, an electrical blackout. Suddenly there's no electricity. Does that ever happen? Okay. California, the Midwest, and New England have all had major blackouts in the last 50 years, including the last 10 years, including the last two years. Well, the nuclear industry and the, the American media have been saying, well, it can't happen in America. Clearly, there's not going to be a tsunami so far inland in Vermont that's going to wipe out the Vermont nuclear power station. So the argument is true, and it's false at the same time, because it's not about the tsunami, and it's not about the earthquake. It's about the loss of off-site power. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. Today on Guns and Butter, Keith Harmon Snow. Today's show, Nuclear Apocalypse in Japan. Keith Snow is an independent journalist, war correspondent, and photographer. He has worked for more than a decade to contest official narratives on war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, while also working as a genocide investigator and consultant to the United Nations and other international bodies. He has won three Project Censored Awards for his Central Africa reportage. Keith Snow holds advanced degrees in electrical engineering and before 1990 worked in classified programs for General Electric, the designer of nuclear reactors now irradiating Japan. Keith Arman Snow, welcome. Hi, Bonnie. Thanks for having me on. Hey, Keith, you write in your article on the catastrophe in Japan that instead of sending nuclear or health experts to assist the Japanese people in their time of desperate need, U.S. President Barack Obama first sent teams of intelligence agents and FEMA-trained military grunts with special security clearances. Is that right? I never read that anywhere else. Yeah, in the first few days, meaning um, the accident or the accident the wave the tsunami the natural disaster the tsunami and the earthquake happened i think friday the 11th and of march and then by monday the obama administration had sent usaid officials those are intelligence agents usaid officials usaid is a pentagon outfit they're very connected to the pentagon and covert forces and we see them as a humanitarian or a development aid organization. They're not. They're intelligence officials. There's a reason that Obama chose top USAID officials to send into Japan in the very first few days. These were not nuclear engineers. They were not nuclear regulatory commission experts. They were intelligence officials. He did send in nuclear experts later, or the U.S. sent in some, I believe they were Department of Energy and NRC officials. NRC being, again, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the primary oversight body for the nuclear power sector in the United States. And at the same time, the United States sent in military. These are basically, I called them military grunts. They're, they had special FEMA clearances, but they were described as soldiers sent in for humanitarian purposes to help with the relief effort and with the rescue effort. They had special FEMA training. This was in the news reports that talked about it in the first few days. And they had special clearances, which was also discussed in the news reports that talked about this in the very few days. So we had a combination of military personnel. And remember, there's a, there's a base, a primary U.S. military base, Air Force base, just to the north, just to the north of Sendai in Japan, which is the U.S.'s uh, number one reconnaissance and refueling base. And who knows what other covert operations go on there, but for their reconnaissance of China, Mongolia, Russia, and North Korea. And that's in northern Japan. And Japan, of course, has many U.S. military bases and a long history of U.S. military occupation since 1945. 
You also write that the Pentagon floated a naval strike force led by the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan off the coast of Japan. Advertised as a humanitarian operation, the strike force was repositioned after it was partially irradiated. What uh, is the point of a naval strike force in this situation? Same thing. It was argued that it was uh, humanitarian, that the U.S. Navy was off the shore helping out. And, you know, any reasonable human being would accept, including myself, the fact that the U.S. Navy and the U.S. military, the Air Force, has the capacity to help out in these situations in ways that no one else perhaps does. In other words, Department of Energy experts aren't offshore. They're, they, you know, they're not, they don't have helicopters at their disposal. They don't have Navy SEALs, et cetera, et cetera. But to describe this as a humanitarian operation when the United States has no intentions of it being strictly humanitarian is very deceptive. So the strike force offshore, the aircraft carrier, for example, is there for other reasons to make sure that any nuclear material, for example, I mean, we can postulate scenarios here. Nukes are melting down or nukes are under attack or as we were given in the first few days, the nukes are fine, but there's been a tidal wave and there's been an earthquake. And we need to make sure, meaning the U.S. military needs to make sure that North Korea doesn't send in any agents who slip some of that nuclear material out, for example. I mean, I'm just postulating. And these are reasonable postulations because the U.S. military does not have a humanitarian record and they're not there for humanitarian purposes. And so when the radiation did get high, they pulled further offshore. And, and they were, I think they were, 50 or 100 miles out to begin with. They weren't sitting right on the inshore there. They weren't, you know, in surfing um, range of the, the nuclear plant. They were very far out, and the radiation levels increased, and they pulled out even further. Yeah, that's right. Um, I had the impression that the Japanese were left to struggle with this disaster on their own. I expected to see teams from other countries arrive, but I didn't see help coming for them. Do I have the wrong impression? No, well, you basically have the right impression. The U.S. sent in these small teams of military grunts, these, these FEMA-cleared, classified, special clearances, professionals who have a mission. We don't know what that mission is. That should be the subject of a congressional hearing. They should be deposed under oath. But they go in, they give them the presentation of being humanitarian. There were also a few Department of Energy experts that were sent in eventually. But other than the truly so-called humanitarian groups that went in, like World Vision, for example, the rescue efforts, there were no, there was no international cooperation on the subject of these nuclear plants, and that's part of the reason that in the first week, they went from being in an absolutely horrible state to being in a state of, of cataclysm, disaster, and apocalypse. And this is not overstating the situation, if we understand what's going on and what went on and what is going to go on there. Uh, Keith, you have advanced degrees in electrical engineering and worked in classified programs for General Electric, the manufacturer of reactors, or actually, I guess, the designer of reactors now irradiating Japan. The six reactors that make up the Fukushima site are Mark I boiling water reactors. What can you tell us about this design? Couldn't be worse, Bonnie. General Electric is the one who devised the Mark I design back in the 60s. They began this, these constructions, these designs back in the 50s, actually, after Admiral Hyman Rickover invented, under an accelerated program, the first nuclear power plant for a submarine. And that would be the, I shouldn't say nuclear power plant, I should say nuclear reactor, because plant makes it sound clean and safe, and it's not. It's a reactor for the submarine Nautilus. And that was a small design. And from 19... 53, when the Nautilus was completed and demonstrated to work, the United States government, with certain officials who believed in, in the so-called peaceful atom, they rushed into the next phase, which would be the creation of these gigantic, scaled-up models of the little reactor that Rickover created, which included Westinghouse in particular and um, General Electric. Westinghouse created something called a pressurized water reactor, and General Electric created the boiling water reactor. And these are the two primary designs that comprise the American nuclear fleet today of 104 operating reactors. There were, of course, other smaller reactor nuclear power companies that have come and gone, and I can't remember the names of them at the moment, but there's some that came and haven't gone. They're still around. But for the most part, the big nukes were created by GE. So the BWR, 
the boiling water reactor Mark One is 23 reactors in the United States are Mark One BWRs, including Vermont Yankee, I think San Onofre in California, as well as Diablo Canyon. I believe those two are also boiling water. And the Fukushima reactors, of course, boiling water. So what's important to note is this could happen to either a pressurized water reactor, a PWR, or a BWR. The fact that they're GE BWRs in Fukushima just is a, is a stroke of fate that might hopefully put this corporation out of business. But they could have been PWRs, and I believe they would have had the same problems, or they would have had similar problems. So it's not really the design so much as it is the fact that any reactor created in that rush operation from 1956 to 1972 in particular, these reactors were scaled up models. They were not tested. It's basically a subject of economy of scale. They decided that these little reactors, the little reactor from the Nautilus could be scaled up in design. Everything could be made bigger. And of course, the first fundamental problem you have from an engineering side of things is water hammer. For example, water pipes. If you turn on your water faucet, sometimes it, it makes that and you can't figure out what the problem is. That's called water hammer. It's, it's, a, it's a pressure situation where the water is being forced through a pipe that's too small or has reached a resonating frequency. And that's what happens in these nuclear plants with these pipes that can be up to, I believe, two feet in diameter. And some of them, of course, are only six inches or four inches in diameter, too. So these are some of the problems. And there's all kinds of uh, cracking of the parts that are used and the different subsystems. And, of course, one of the main ideas behind nuclear power is that that they operate on the basis of defense in depth. In other words, if the reactor goes into a scram, has a problem, and needs to shut down, it'll shut down first. That's the first level. Second level is if there's a problem with an emergency core cooling, then the emergency core cooling system will come on. And then you've got other defense in depth redundant systems that are supposed to protect us when any one system fails. And the problem is, over the years, in order to make these nukes actually perform in a way that can be anything close to called competitive, meaning that they could generate a profit, which is impossible in a nuclear sector to begin with, and we can talk about why. They, they have increased the output power of these plants beyond what was the actual design amount. They've increased the, uh, the capacity. They've decreased the downtimes, and, and basically they run them longer, faster, and hotter. And they don't do safety checks. And some of the safety problems that come up when they have a problem is they, they go back to the paperwork, the designs, and the, um, and the blueprints, and some vent or some pipe or some, some valve has been removed to make the system work better. And when they go back to find out why they can't shut the valve down, it's gone. So they haven't documented properly the problems with these plants, the changes that have been made. And it's all about economics. It's all about these big corporations maximizing profits, minimizing downtimes, and, and minimizing any concerns for public health and public safety. Well, Keith, I was about to ask you what the major safety issues are uh, in these General Electric-designed uh, boiling water reactors I guess these were built by Hitachi at Fukushima, but I guess you pretty much already answered that. Let me, let me speak to that for a moment. General Electric is 60% owner of the GE Hitachi joint nuclear venture, which is basically out of the United States. They teamed up a few years ago. The six Fukushima nukes, which are operated by the Tokyo Electric Power Company, that's why we always hear about TEPCO or Tokyo Electric Power Company, that's the operator. Like in New England, you've got the New England Electric Power System, and they're the operator. Or Pacific Gas and Electric would be the operator out in California, perhaps, for the San Onofre plant or the Diablo Canyon plants. But they were built, those were built by GE, I believe. And so the six Fukushimas are operated by TEPCO, but the reactors were built, one of them was built by GE, two of them were built by Toshiba, two of them were built by GE with Toshiba, and one of them was built by Hitochi. And they have all kinds of safety problems, long list of safety problems. I mean, so many safety problems that there are handbooks six inches thick about any one of these safety problems. And they produce report after report after report, an inch thick or half an inch thick, and eight and a half by 11 size that talk about various pieces of these different many, many, many safety problems. I'm speaking with independent journalist Keith Harmon Snow. Today's show, Nuclear Apocalypse in Japan. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This 
is guns and butter. You write that the absence of cooling water facilitated the nuclear crisis in Japan and that most likely some major reactor components, proven unsafe, also failed under the seismic stresses of the 9.0 quake. These factors were complicated by the loss of off-site electrical power, an electrical blackout, the failure of emergency diesel generators, and the subsequent loss of coolant, which is water. So there is no electrical power available to cool the reactors? And this is what we need to worry about most in the world, Bonnie, is the, is the, um, the, the loss of off-site electrical power. So we've got a nuclear power plant here in Vermont, Vermont Yankee. And, uh, well, the nuclear industry and the, the American media have been saying, well, it can't happen in America. Clearly, there's not going to be a tsunami so far inland in Vermont that's going to wipe out the Vermont nuclear power station. So the argument is true, and it's false at the same time, because it's not about the tsunami, and it's not about the earthquake. And in fact, the Vermont Yankee is on a small earthquake fault, not like Japan. But it's not about the earthquake or the tsunami. It's about the loss of off-site power. So what happened with the tsunami in Japan is the earthquake hit. It was basically a 9.0, caused major vibrational, rotational stresses, vibrational shocks that generated all kinds of stresses inside the nuclear plant. And then the tsunami hit, and we, we can guess what happened. First of all, it hit a vertical face. The building that it hit is square. It didn't have anything to help the wave pass by. It just slammed it. The wave hit it, and then we don't know what effects the tsunami or the earthquake had. We can only imagine. But what happened next was emergency generators that are supposed to keep the plant uh, in a state of emergency power, there was no power, so the, they couldn't run the cooling systems that are supposed to keep the reactor cool and keep the spent fuel pools cool, and this is extremely important. Spent fuel pools are as dangerous or more dangerous than the reactors themselves. So the spent fuel pool cooling systems and the reactor cooling systems, as soon as the wave and the earthquake hit, we are told these three reactors that had been operating immediately went into shutdown because they have a sensor system which is supposed to insert the, uh, the rods that stop the nuclear fission reaction, and then it goes into shutdown, and then it's supposed to be cooled because the heat is still there. You know, if you make a wood fire, you can close the stove up tight, but you've still got heat coming out of that stove for hours. And so what you had was all this nuclear heat basically coming out of this, this plant not being cooled because there's no cooling system, because there's no power. The emergency generators failed. The emergency diesel generators failed, whether it was from seawater or whether it was from some plug didn't work anymore because somebody hadn't documented. Maybe they hadn't tested the emergency generators because they operate under the conditions that nothing's going to happen. It becomes a sense of you become more and more complacent with 40 years of operations, which is what Hitochi or GE or... A TEPCO has seen. They've seen 40 years of operations out of these Fukushima plants, for example. And they've decided, perhaps, that they don't need to check such and such a system. The bottom line is they're so complex that human, human awareness can't keep up with the changes that are made or the possible problems. And these plants in Japan, just like every plant in America, have had major problems previously. We're talking about huge so-called leaks, containment, problems with the containment systems, which are supposed to keep the radioactivity inside. But going back to the point... Off-site electrical power is the problem. What we're talking about in, in New England or in California or in Pennsylvania or in Wisconsin with any one of these nuclear plants sitting next to some body of water is not a tsunami coming in on the Connecticut River at Vermont Yankee, but it's loss of off-site power. It's a blackout, a, an electrical blackout. Suddenly there's no electricity. Does that ever happen? Okay. California, the Midwest, and New England have all had major blackouts in the last 50 years, including the last 10 years, including the last two years. Blackouts occur when there's a thunderstorm and a lightning strike, and that's what caused the, the community near Yankee Atomic, the row reactor in Massachusetts, in 1992. They shut it down. The community shut it down because there was an electrical strike, and it caused a scram, and it scared the life out of these people in this tiny little community in Massachusetts. So an electrical strike or a thunderstorm or a snowstorm, a blizzard, or a combination of these things with human error, with lack of preparedness, with the arrogance, and with the loss of off-site power and the failure of a generator, you have apocalypse.
which is what we're seeing in Japan, these big meltdown scenarios. So in Japan, again, back to that subject, what could have happened was very likely, and this is the most important thing to note about bringing a reactor online, it's the first hour, let's say, just like if you take off in an airplane, it's the takeoff you have to worry about and the landing. It's not the, the operation at 20,000 feet in a steady state. It's the, it's the dynamics that occur, the stresses, changes in temperatures, the forces that occur on takeoff in an airplane that can cause a turbine fracture. For example, these giant turbine blades that they use on most jet airplanes, non-propeller airplanes, have a problem called uh, turbine fracture. The blades fracture and fly off, and then they become a missile, and they fly through the, the fuselage of the airplane, and then you have a plane crash. These happen on takeoff and landing, mostly. They don't happen in steady state. And the turbine blade problem also exists at a nuclear plant because they use turbines, big, gigantic turbines, the same ones with the same problems in these nuclear plants. And this is very well documented. But getting back to the point, which was the loss of off-site power and the startup or the shutdown of a reactor is the most dangerous time because it's going through these incredibly high stresses in temperature, pressure, nuclear reaction, vibrations, shock. And that's when something's going to fail. And once it fails, going online, they may not know that something failed. If we're talking about a reactor operating in the United States at this moment, for example, they take it down, they check a few safety things, but mostly it's to refuel to offload the bad fuel, the used fuel, and onload the new fuel. And then there's a state when they power it up, and that's the most scary first hour because something can fail and they may not know it. And by the time they go to shutdown, whether it's a, it's a justified shutdown because of a power outage or because they need to change the fuel or whether it's a shutdown because of an emergency situation, something has failed and they don't know it. And that's what could have happened in Japan. The earthquake, a 9.0. And these things were designed for something in the, I believe it was in the 7 point or the 8 point range, which is significant. They were designed more stringent than American plants. The Japanese are technological geniuses. They can do, if the Japanese can't do it. I mean, if you've ever ridden the Shinkansen, 365, something like that, 365 miles an hour is their record speed. But even the normal Shinkansen at 140 miles an hour, and, and it's precise to the moment. You can set your clock knowing that if the Shinkansen is coming in at 345.56, it's going to come in at 345.54 plus or minus 10 seconds. I mean, they're precise to the second or the minute. The precision in Japan. So anyway, the point is that these reactors could have seen some major damage when the earthquake hit. And we're told that the, uh, the shutdown rods were reinserted. And these are basically, I believe they're boron, but I, I'm not quite sure. They reinsert these rods, which stop the nuclear reactor because they're made to shut down the reaction. And the rods, we're told, were inserted. So the reaction stopped. The thing went into shutdown. And then, because of the tsunami or because somebody made an error, then the problems happened. So they basically argue that the plant was safe. It's just that the tsunami hit. And that's not true. It's not the tsunami or the earthquake, effectively, that caused the problem that we're seeing here. It was, the, it was the fact that the diesel generators that were supposed to save it didn't work. And the, and the extra safety systems that were supposed to save it didn't work. The emergency core cooling system, something cracked. It may have lost all the coolant, all the water that was in the system that was supposed to cool it. And I believe these plants, these BWRs, use something like, it's a phenomenal number, and I could check it, but it's like a, it's not a million gallons a day. It's something like a million gallons an hour. Even if it's a million gallons a day, it's a lot of water. And something happened to the system so that this nuclear plant that's within 200 feet of the Pacific Ocean, which is its, its heat sink and its cooling source, it can't access all of that water. Imagine that, sitting right next to an ocean. Theoretically, you could bulldoze the problem into the ocean, and all that water would cool it down. Of course... Then you've got an irradiated Pacific Ocean. So you try to keep the radiation out of the water systems and out of the air and limit it to the soil. Of course, this can't be done. And in summary, that's, that's generally the answer to your question. Keith, for three years, from 1990 to 1993, you taught English in Japan and explored the countryside and studied Japanese culture. What did your experience living in Japan teach you about the country 
that is relevant to the current disaster. Now, I know you've just mentioned how how um, advanced and specifically uh, technologically advanced the Japanese are. What else about uh, Japan would be relevant here? Technological advancement is important. What's really important here, Bonnie, and this may be what you're asking for, what's important to note about Japan is it's a tiny little island. I mean, it's, it's a big island, but it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively contained kind of place. It's, it's very insular, and you have different features of this insular island, which makes it significant in terms of what happened here. And one of those things is the failure of the public to speak out. The whole mentality of the Japanese psyche after and because of World War II is not to speak out, not to become a whistleblower, somebody who stands up and says, and works for the nuclear industry, for example, who says, by the way, these plants are not safe. We need to change this. Hello, hello. Is anybody listening? Whistleblowers are punished in the United States just like they were in Japan. A whistleblower in Japan is not, a, is not a likely possibility because they have a saying in Japan, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. So what we're talking about is groupthink, especially within the nuclear sector. And that's not just about Japan. It's within the nuclear sector in the United States as well. We have a problem with groupthink where all of these, many of these engineers or all these engineers and technologists have decided that nuclear power is safe. Of course, they have to justify it because it's where their paycheck comes from, and they don't want to believe they're putting their lives in danger by working every day around radiation. But in Japan, the groupthink phenomena is very significant. It's a very regimented, very orderly, a very um, don't speak out, don't make any waves kind of a society. So, for example, when I was late getting on a train, or, for example, my friend is coming and I want to get on the train and my friend is coming and they're not quite there, but I can see him coming, so I hold the door. This is like nuclear war in Japan. The, the Japanese um, conductors come running and they're yelling at you, dumb it, dumb it. It's just something you wouldn't do. A Japanese person would not hold the door like we would in New York. You hold the door for the subway and somebody gets on. It's regimented. You don't do anything that upsets the social order in that way. And people are very... Uh, careful not to upset the social order. Another problem you have in Japan that's very significant, and, and anybody who thinks that I'm interested in bashing Japan uh, should think again, because these problems that exist are significant in the United States or Europe or anywhere else. But another major problem in Japan is alcoholism. A lot of the corporations, uh, the corporate culture is to spend a lot of time at work give your entire life to the corporation, and when you're done at the end of the day, which may be a 16-hour day, you go out and get hammered. And, you know, it raises questions about safety of these kinds of technologies because it's, it's everywhere. It's not just a few people getting drunk. It's, it's the culture. The culture is drinking and drinking after, after work hours. So the main points there are groupthink, and that I would say that I learned about Japan is this groupthink phenomenon and, and uh, not speaking out, not upsetting the apple cart. Activism is seen as, as you're treated, if you're an activist in Japan, you're treated as if you're a, an alien from another planet. People walk right by you. They don't pay any attention to you. And I was involved in direct action in Japan. As a journalist, I was covering some direct action by uh, Bruno Manser, the famous Swiss man who was working to stop the uh, Japanese Soga Shosha timber corporations from committing genocide in uh, Sarawak, Malaysia, which is still going on. So those are some of the important things to remember about Japan. And also, it's a very technological society everywhere. You know, it's not this image that people have of Japan of these uh, Buto dancers. I mean, these things exist too. Buto dancers and temples and uh, beautiful gardens and very well manicured. And that brings up the other issue. Nature is controlled. And nature is manicured, and the attempt to control nature is significant, including giant walls along almost every major river in Japan so that it won't flood. And these are made of cement. So you're creating non-natural boundaries to the natural ecosystem, which just basically kills off nature in Japan. So the extent of nature in Japan has been greatly killed off. Um, very unenvironmental society. And this doesn't mean everybody. And I'm not saying that it's worse or better than the United States. We're just speaking about a very, you know, indigenous, basically an indigenous population. The Japanese culture is very heavily Japanese language. Not so many English speakers, even though there's more and more all the time.
I would expect to see a couple of, a few, if not a couple of many, suicides in the next month or two. And these may be top nuclear officials, they may be uh, TEPCO officials, they may be government officials, they may be ordinary people. But uh, the phenomenon of shame, of shaming the society, of letting your people down, of letting your family down, it's just not accepted. People cannot live with the shame in Japan. So suicide is a big deal. Suicide is a way out. And there have been some suicides in the nuclear sector in the past two decades. I can't give you the dates, but I believe it was the Manju Breeder Reactor, which is also in Japan and is very, very dangerous compared to a nuclear power plant as well. But I think it was one of the officials, either of the Manju Reactor or of one of the nuclear companies that uh, tried to cover up some radiation leaks a few years ago or some corruption and then committed suicide. So suicide is, I think, something we may, unfortunately and sadly, we may see more of that. I'm speaking with independent journalist Keith Harmon Snow. Today's show, Nuclear Apocalypse in Japan. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. You say that you began your career as a journalist by looking deeply into the rabbit hole of nuclear power from 1993 to 2000. You visited the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's public document rooms which has since been closed in many places, where you read thousands of microfilms and scanned microfiche records and excavated documents. What did you discover in your investigations of nuclear power? Well, the public document rooms, Bonnie, were originally created, I think, in the 60s or 70s. And at some point, they put a public document room near every reactor in the United States. The purpose is to provide a sense, a false sense, I, I would claim and do claim a false sense of transparency so anybody in the united states could go up to the public document room near their reactor and so i did this we had a reactor yankee row the first reactor one of the first small react the very small reactor built in 1960 or 58 59 and it was the yankee atomic power plant what the industry has says it set the record for safety but it had its problems and it had its releases of nuclear waste and all that and nearby, this is in Rowe, Massachusetts, a very isolated section of the state in the west on the Deerfield River. And nearby in the town of Greenfield, the city of Greenfield, the public document room was located at Greenfield Community College. And you go in the library there in the public document room and it's got stacks and stacks and stacks of fish. Actually, it was in the library at Greenfield Community College that you found the public document room itself, which was just a little section dedicated to the, the, the public document room aspects. And you find reams and reams of microfiche and microfilms. And these are little three by five cards slipped into a white envelope that you pull them out and they've got all these pages and pages and pages of documents on each one. And I started to research different pieces of the problem or different pieces of the story about nuclear power. And I wanted particularly to look at Yankee Atomic. So I tried to find everything I could on Yankee Atomic. And the first thing that you would discover if you could do this today and you can't because they've taken away the public document rooms precisely because of people like, you know, me and others, many, 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 many others who've done so many years of dedicated work to try to expose the problems here. And uh, they've taken them away. But you could walk in at the time and find the information on Yankee Atomic. And so that's what I looked for. And I found it's intentionally disorganized. Documents are intentionally removed from where they're supposed to be and put somewhere else. It was incredibly disorganized. You couldn't find something that was referenced. If you found something, from my point of view, about Yankee Atomic, it was either because somebody told you exactly what to look for and exactly how to find it and exactly where it would be, or that you tripped over it accidentally in some other section. And these public document rooms had all the documents of the NRC and all the documents of the, the corporations to the NRC and all the communications back and forth about uh, hearings and about the public sector. But basically, overall, if you're awake and you really want to look at the, and understand what's going on, you get a sense very quickly that something's being hidden from you. So you can find documents that say very clearly, Yankee Atomic had a, a pipe break and so much of radioactivity was released to the environment. It ran down this drain, this uh, service drain, and it entered the Deerfield River on this and this date, probably included these radionuclides. Uh, another date you find that's... Uh, the, the plant was shut down to make such and such a repairs. And sure enough, they found that the core shroud, 
which is a you have a shroud in your car near your radiator to keep the radiator air focused around the radiator. That's a shroud. Or it's like a, a cape. When you go out in the weather, you wear a cape. It's a core shroud cracking problem. And sure enough, somebody else had a core shroud cracking problem. The NRC has sent out an alert, and they want you to check your plants. Well, the companies say, well, we're not going to shut down and check this right now. We'll check it the next time we refuel. So maybe a month later, they check it, and they find out, sure enough, the core shroud has got a huge problem with this cracking issue. And it's basically because it's been radiated with neutrons under high pressure and temperature, and it's it's uh, it's embrittled, meaning, you know, everybody thinks of peanut brittle. Think of peanut brittle. You drop it on the floor, and it shatters into a thousand pieces. And that's exactly what happens to all these components that are radiated with neutron flux, with neutrons in the reactor. They become embrittled, including the pipes that are involved in the, in the emergency core cooling system or the pressurized water steam generators. This embrittlement problem has something that the industry has known about since 1964. And it's complicated by the fact or compounding by the fact that they don't care about it. And the uh, components are now 40 years old. They've been operating in this embrittled state, and aging has made them even more embrittled. Over time, they become more and more susceptible to shattering. Imagine a, a 5.0 quake coming along. It could shatter any one of these many components that have this problem of embrittlement. And so back in the 1970s, when they you know, started to study this embrittlement problem, and this gives you an idea of how insular and how corrupt the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the industry is, they learned that this embrittlement thing was a problem, and they, they traced it back to the super alloys. And super alloys are the, the uh, metals, the pipes. Alloy is a is a metal that's it's a steel that basically has different elements, including cobalt or nickel. And a super alloy is made up with so much nickel, so much cobalt, so much perhaps iron, you know, to make a super alloy which can withstand these high pressures, temperatures, stresses. So the super alloys are fracturing and they're shattering and they're breaking and they're they're embrittled. And what they need to do is go back and study the super alloy and, and figure out why it's doing that. And what it comes down to, if you look into this story, is that they wanted to make pipes and they wanted to make components for nuclear power plants that would need to be replaced. It's called planned obsolescence because if you don't have to replace anything in your car and you have a car that was made in 1935, it'll go on and on and on. We all know this. And the same thing with a Ford tractor made in 1946. That little tractor will go on and on and on just like the one that I have that I used so many hundreds of hours last summer. It's because it was before planned obsolescence. So these plants were designed with planned obsolescence in mind, meaning the parts would fail. They knew they would fail. They knew they would fail after a certain amount of time, and they'd have to be replaced. The problem they didn't foresee or think about or care about was that planned obsolescence in the nuclear arena does not work economically or physically because they've been irradiated. So the steam generators, the core shroud, the boiling water reactor, they're incredibly hot after 40 years of radiation or even after one year of radiation and operations at these high temperatures and incredibly high output powers. You can't walk in there and pull out the radiator like you can in your car and replace it because you've got to deal with humans, safety issues, radiation, and then once you get it out, what do you do with it? You have to dump it in a hole somewhere. So there's the whole subject of disposal of high-level and so-called low-level radioactive waste. So it became uneconomical to pull these parts out and replace them. They made a gigantic mistake. All of these factors contribute to the failure of nuclear power as an industry in the United States and abroad. And there's 410 reactors in the world. How has the Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, been dealing with the nuclear disaster? You write that authorities are not in the control room, nor anywhere near the station's number three reactor, for instance, as the reactors are too hot. Is the situation out of control? Well, today is the tsunami and the earthquake hit. I think it was March 11th. It was a Friday in any place. It was either the 10th or the 11th. And now we're going on uh, more than 10 days. And the situation has been out of control from the very first day. It was out of control as recent as last Friday. The news coming out of there over the weekend, uh, basically, what are we talking about, March 20th? The news coming out of the weekend has been very mute. There's very conflicting reports coming out of Japan about the status of the nuclear plants. There's some 
stories saying that they've managed to move several of the reactors into a safe situation. They don't talk about the spent fuel pools, which we haven't either. There's stories that say that uh, such and such a reactor, number three, for example, now has electrical power. But the exact status is, is unknown at this moment. It's quite possibly, and it seems to me quite possibly still, very much out of control. But it was out of control as we went into the weekend. It was absolutely out of control. In fact, the, um, the reactors were so hot that they didn't want to send people in. The controllers were not in the control room because they didn't have any clue what was going on with the reactor. News reports were saying how they were able to see a gigantic explosion, which they believe was reactor number three. Now, there's six reactors. It's a very big complex. In order to get such a viewpoint and not be in the radiation yourself, you have to be standing back somewhere, and it clearly was not in the control room. So they weren't in the control room. They were not in control. They were completely out of control. And remember, there are six Fukushima reactors. Three of them were not operating at the time of the tsunami and the earthquake. We are told they were in safe shutdown. Three of them were operating. Number one, two, and three were the ones that were operating. Number four, five, and six were not operating. Each of these reactors has spent fuel pool, and there's one additional common spent fuel pool for all six. All of these spent fuel pools, all seven spent fuel pools, are themselves gigantic problems, especially under the situation we see in Japan where they had a loss of coolant. So even when they were talking about the reactors, they weren't telling us what was going on with the spent fuel pools. And the nuclear experts, the anti-nuclear experts and the nuclear experts who know this, know that the spent fuel pools are there and are wondering what's going on with the spent fuel pools. We're not being told anything. TEPCO was not telling GE was not telling, the American press was repeating the nonsense coming out of Japan, and they were not telling, or they were actively covering it up by making statements, for example, that said the uh, reactor number three has had a hydrogen explosion. This is because uh, the pressure built up, and they, they did a planned release of steam, which created a hydrogen explosion because of the combination of hydrogen with oxygen outside the building. And nobody is at any risk from the radiation. There's no radiation risk. This is what they've done forever. The nuclear industry says in one breath, they say there was a leak today reported at the Three Mile Island, but uh, there's no risk to the public. They're always in the same sentence, and this is exactly what they did, downplaying the problem in Japan from day one to day ten. I'm speaking with independent journalist Keith Harmon Snow. Today's show, Nuclear Apocalypse in Japan. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. Well, what can you tell us about the Fukushima spent fuel pools? What are they and where are they located? Well, for example, in my story, if people look at the picture that I posted there from the TEPCO, from the reactor site, you see a picture of reactor building number three and reactor building number four. Building number four is reasonably intact. And the problem in number four was the spent fuel pool. Finally, they started talking about spent fuel pool, and they were talking about a loss of coolant at the spent fuel pool number four. But nobody was talking about spent fuel pool number three, which had the hydrogen explosion. You look at that picture, the spent fuel pool is apparently gone. Now, that doesn't mean the spent fuel rods are gone, and it doesn't mean the radiation is gone by any stretch of the imagination. The spent fuel pools, in a stroke of human brilliance, were put off the ground above the reactor, three or four stories up in these effectively, you know, little swimming pool kind of structures, little basins, you know, like a swimming pool, a small swimming pool, stacked with these used fuel rods that are coming out of the reactor, going into the pool to keep them cool, and they're three or four stories up above the reactor. They're not inside primary containment. And here's another aspect of the defense in depth. Defense in depth means you've got your reactor where the core is heating up and you've got the radioactivity being generated eventually converted into steam boiling water to turn turbines which turn it into electricity so basically what we're doing is using a you know a kind of a nuclear bomb to generate boiled water so the spent fuel pool is incredibly dangerous of course we can talk about the radiation and the, and the effects on human health from the Releases from the everyday releases of any nuclear plant in America, problem one. From the releases of so-called leaks and so-called accidents that are the non-daily events. 
And then we can talk about the emergency events like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, or Fukushima reactor. And then we can talk about the spent fuel pool. And they all have different radioisotopes associated with their operations and with their releases. And the spent fuel pool has something called cesium-137. Cesium-137 is incredibly toxic, and it moves into our environment mostly through the aquatic systems, which means as the nuclear plant sucks water in from the Pacific Ocean at Fukushima, cools the reactor and sends the water back out, and comes in, cools the spent fuel pool and sends it back out, and it doesn't flow right in between the rods. It's a separated thing where you've got the coolant system is such that you're not pulling the water right off the spent fuel pool and dumping into the ocean. It's separated. But at the same time, it's radiated, and it's radiated, and it's leaking and dumping cesium-137 into the ocean or the Connecticut River or the uh, Great Lakes of the United States or the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. So the spent fuel pool is all these packed spent fuel rods, and they have to be cooled. And they're in the spent fuel pool because what do we do with nuclear waste? In the United States, there's probably 104 spent fuel pools. Each reactor has one, or maybe each reactor site. For example, there's three millstone reactors in southern Connecticut, and they may have one common spent fuel pool. But the typical spent fuel pool has the radioactive capacity in terms of radioactivity and devastation. For example, Hiroshima was, I believe, a 1,000 curies worth of radiation. Hiroshima, the atomic bomb. A typical spent fuel pool has 75 million curies of radiation, of radioactive destruction. Why do we have spent fuel pools? Why do we have swimming pools sitting around at, at 55 or 104 locations in the United States? And I say 55 because I'm dividing 104 in two, effectively. Or we could divide it in three and say, at best, there's 33 or 35 spent fuel pools in the United States. But I'd say it's closer to 104. Why do we have these little swimming pools full of nuclear waste? Because we have no place to put it because they want to put it at Yucca Mountain or the Mescalero Apache Initiative, which is to dump it on a, a Mescalero Apache site in uh, either New Mexico, Arizona, or Nevada, or dump it in deep, 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 deep down. Okay. They want to put it in Yucca Mountain. They've got this big nuclear site, this gigantic hole they've created at Yucca Mountain, spending billions and billions and billions of taxpayer dollars, and they realize, and experts have come forward and said, you just can't pump it down in there. It's going to get into the water systems. It's going to get into the earth. It's going to make us all sick. So experts have said this, but the government is trying to move forward the Yucca Mountain Project, which basically you put spent fuel in onto trucks or trains. You ship it across the country from Massachusetts or from Vermont, and you put it down in the ground way, way down there, claiming that there's not going to be an earthquake or there's not going to be a flood or nothing's going to affect it. It's not going to work, but at the present time, they aren't dumping them in Yucca Mountain. They're keeping them on site or they're putting them in cement. They're so-called dry casks. And these things are incredibly hot and they're radiating and they're all over the world. They're all over the country. And the best thing to do with these would be to leave them on the nuclear site. So we, we have 104 nuclear reactor sites in the United States. It's actually a few more because they've decommissioned several reactors. And these should become sacrifice zones. So 150 or 2,000 years from now, somebody doesn't come along with a spoon and dig up, for example, the Sherman Reservoir at uh, Yankee Row, about 15 or 20 feet or 30 feet down under the water at the Sherman Reservoir, where you can go and swim today, even though there are signs that say no trespassing, 30 or 40 feet down in the sludge, which is the mud where the reactor outpipe was, there are radiotoxins that are so deadly they would kill you within 15 seconds. Wow. And these spent fuel pools are packed with cesium-137. The half-life on cesium-137 is more than eight days, which is what we're always, you know, often told. These half-lives are so short. And anyway, the point of a half-life, it's also used by the industry to make it sound like these things aren't around for very long. The half-life of iodine-131, for example, is eight days. Iodine-131 was released at Fukushima into the air in the first few days. It has an eight-day half-life. And that means that in eight days, half of whatever was released disappears. And the other half disappears in the next eight days. And the other half of what's left disappears in the next eight days and on to perpetuity. So for a half-life of 135 years or half-life of five years for cobalt-60, I believe, and cobalt-60 has been found in the Connecticut River, you've got to remember it's the size. It's also the mass of the radionuclide or the radiotoxin material. It's not just 
how long does it decay and disappear? It doesn't disappear after five years, even though the half-life is five years. And then if you get an even longer half-life, it, it goes on for much, much longer. I'm going to give you a couple half-lives in a minute. For example, in my story, I point out that some of the reporting that's come out of the American press, one thing that went viral on the web was this thing by a professor at MIT. MIT is very pro-nuclear. And this guy wrote an article in the first few days of the Fukushima disaster, basically said, no one's ever going to die at Fukushima. And if you're afraid of this, you don't need to worry, and this is why. And so in there it says, by the time you spell R-A-D-I-O-N-U-C-L-I-D-E, radionucleotide, by the time you spell radionucleotide, they will be harmless. This is such a huge lie. And this thing went viral. And so what are the half-lives? Iodine-131, eight days. And iodine-131 causes thyroid cancer. That's why you go to Chernobyl, you've got a lot of people with thyroid cancers. A lot of thyroid cancers around Three Mile Island. And there's going to be a lot of thyroid cancers in Japan. Cesium-137, half-life of 30 years. Plutonium-239, a half-life of 24,000 years. And there's plutonium in the spent fuel pools. What does the Price-Anderson Act passed in 1957? Back in the 1950s, when they tried to rush forward nuclear power, they had promised the president and the presidential commission, scientific commission, had promised the, the United States that we were going to move nuclear power into, into a reality very quickly. And then it turned out to be far more difficult. And the corporations didn't want to have anything to do with it because there were studies done in the 1950s that produced information, for example, that documented that estimated the risk of a nuclear power plant in New York just a little bit north of New York City, which it turns out there is one right now. And back in the 50s, they did this study, and they decided that if there was a nuclear power plant problem, it could affect so many thousands and thousands of people and these kind of economic losses and these other problems. And the nuclear industry looked at these, these uh, the pre-nuclear corporations. Westinghouse was an electric company, electric light bulbs and electric boats in the military and weapons but not nuclear. They got involved in nuclear later, in the 50s and 60s, where, whenever. GE as well. But at the same time, they got involved in, only in nuclear because they were insured against any problems if there was a catastrophe. The Price-Anderson Act was created by Al Gore, Albert Gore Sr., in, in the 1956, and, the, and it was passed as the Price-Anderson Act, I think under a different name in 1957. It indemnifies the nuclear reactor Producers, GE, the laboratories that work with nuclear weapons, example, and uh, Westinghouse, it indemnifies them from any lawsuits from the public in case of a major nuclear problem. So you and I can't go out and sue the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and we can't sue the U.S. government, and we can't sue the corporations, or perhaps we can if there's a small you know, problem, but we can't recover the kind of money that we deserve to recover. Or if we do recover it, it's not coming from the corporation that created the problem. It's coming from the taxpayers. Taxpayers support the Price-Anderson Act, which indemnifies the nuclear companies from any loss in the event of a nuclear disaster, a nuclear power cataclysm. They're not only are they subsidized, they're subsidized at every level. They're subsidized for the uranium mining, which kills people in Niger, the uranium sector in Niger, in the desert there, the uranium mining in the United States and in, in, in Canada. Everywhere you have uranium mining, you have death and, and despair from the local people, Native Americans. So you get death and despair there. But throughout the entire nuclear cycle, you've got different pieces of the puzzle that are supported by the U.S. government and by taxpayers. We pay for these things to operate. They are not efficient. They are not economical. We make them run, and we make corporations profits to run them. But they could never be run, they could never be built, and they could never be dismantled without all of the money that the American taxpayer provides. If there's a problem, the Price-Anderson Act, taxpayers will pay to resolve it. Nobody, no executive from any corporation dealing with the nuclear power sector will be held accountable if there's a meltdown at Vermont Yankee or San Onofre in California or the, or the plants down near the Amish country in Pennsylvania. Keith Harmon Snow, thank you very much. Thank you, Monty. I appreciate you having me on. Um, you know, I don't claim to be a nuclear expert, 
But I've studied enough to know some of these facts are very true, and what we're being told is very different from what's really happened. And even at this very moment, the, the press is trying to downplay the scenario in Japan, trying to downplay the radiation release, even while, for example, MSNBC has pulled the reporters out of Japan because of the radiation. So on one hand, they're saying radiation is not a threat in Japan. They're downplaying it. They're saying that if you're afraid of radiation, you have a problem called radiophobia. And on the other hand, they pulled their uh, reporters out. And it's really important to recognize that MSNBC or NBC is owned by a company called General Electric. Yeah, yeah. What it is ain't exactly 